Hi, I'm Bob McCoskery. Welcome to Straight Talk again. Tonight we will continue our discussion around the ratings for the new government since they took office because we've got a couple of different panellists from last week, so we're keen to see what they think. We'll talk about the mainstream media and the circumstances around both News Hub and now the state broadcaster TVNZ, the reasons and the implications for media in general. There's some new research around the unintended consequences of the COVID vaccine mandates in the health sector. And is Jacinda Ardern's Christchurch call losing its way? We may also touch on a poll that gives some interesting results on transgender policies, if we have time. Uh, Without further ado, though, let's introduce our esteemed panel. And there's a couple of new faces there, but let's just deal with the ones we do know. Uh, Firstly, um, uh, Brendan Malone there, bottom right from Christchurch. First time for the year. How are you, Brendan? I'm good, uh, but if you ever say that I'm from Christchurch when yeah. I live in Rangura again, I, I'm afraid that's it. I will never funny. be able to return. I thought that just as I said it. Apologies <laughs> for that. Rangiora. Uh, a Rangiora-ite. Um, also, uh, Simon O'Connor is back for another week, a sucker for punishment. How are you, Simon? Well, if you keep calling me a steen, I'm just going to come <laughs> back here to you know help my, myself. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and Dr. Ate Moala in Wellington, how are you? Um, I'm good, thank you. Okay, I'll come back to you, Arte, because there's something interesting I want to show people about you. Uh, And uh, top centre, without probably needing no introduction, is uh, ex-Cabinet Minister, ex-Act Leader, Rodney Hyde. Welcome, Rodney. Oh, good evening, everyone, and good evening, Bob, and to the fellow panellists. It's a a great honour and a privilege to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, it's great to have you on board, and uh, just to raise the IQ level even more, um, based in Christchurch is Emeritus Professor Rex Arda, who we've finally managed to get on the program. Rex, how are you? Very good, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Well, we're glad you're here as well, because we thought you may be out sort of... uh, sort of, you know, um, crying in your bucket because of the result today in the cricket. And I've actually got a photo here. Uh, That's you in the middle. Um, And, well, can you explain who you've got beside you? Well, uh, on one side of me is Chris Cairns. It's on the right of your picture. The left is Mark Greatbatch. It's the other one. Okay. And uh, that has got to be one of the oldest cricket shirts in the history of cricket shirts, is it? Oh, it's a retro one, you know, back from 30 years ago. Okay. And obviously you were with them in the VIP room because of your stellar career in cricket? No, it's only because of my uh, friendship with Bruce Logan who got me in. (laughs) Oh, okay. I'd never realised Bruce played cricket. Okay. um, Now, Ate, um, you had some very good TV coverage over the weekend. You are very famous. Uh, Let me show it, and then maybe you can just explain a little bit more about it. So this was on... Uh, believe it or not, a very good current events uh, coverage of an issue on Q&A on Sunday morning. The opening of Israel's first Indigenous embassy in February, posted on YouTube by the Friends of Zion Museum, featuring clips of Israel's ambassador to New Zealand and the Pacific being welcomed on Waitangi grounds. An initiative co-founded by Māori academic Dr Cherie Trotter, a pro-Israel activist and now the director of this embassy in Israel, supported by Pacific Indigenous leaders from around the world. We went as Indigenous people from the nations to stand with Jerusalem um, and to say to them, we acknowledge you as the Indigenous people of the land. Dr Ate Moala says she was there representing the people of Tonga with the blessing of Tonga's queen, Nana Sipa Utukuaho. She wanted to send her blessing and her prayers in support of Israel. So that was a privilege for me to send the blessing of the queen and the people of Tonga uh, in Jerusalem. Yeah. Dr Moala, an outspoken activist and a devout Christian, says she was proud to celebrate Israel's indigenous embassy. (laughs) That was joyous. We were dancing, which is our legacy as indigenous people. And I think it was important for Jerusalem to have a celebration during this time. It was wonderful. Yeah, an outspoken activist and a devout Christian. There we are. Do you take that as a compliment, Ate? Lol. <laughs> a Christian, yes. The other one. So, so you were over there with um, Dr. Cherie Trotter, one of our other panellists. Anybody else there that we knew as well that were 
part of the well Perry Cherie's husband yeah uh, I think hmm. uh, uh, Fred couldn't make it because you know Alfred Cherie's um, his mum passed away oh, so Alfred Nardo. Yep. yeah yeah uh, okay. otherwise Alfred would have been there but it was just wonderful to be there with indigenous people from not only from the Pacific but South America Canada you know indigenous people. So it was uh, really a privilege to be there and stand with Israel and with the okay. Jews as the indigenous people. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, now, just uh, before we get into the first question, just the job of the week. Uh, some of you might think that it was that KFC tasting job that everybody was sending to me and asking if I'd applied for it. Uh, but no, actually, the job that I was thinking of applying for was this one. It's the it's with the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and it's the principal. Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Advisor, which um, that's pretty impressive, you know, when you're figuring out the interest rates and, uh, you know, uh, uh, printing of money, you've got to figure out whether it's inclusive and diverse or something, is it? Figure out what pronouns we have on the dollar, on the $10 note. I don't know. Anyway, interesting. Uh, right, okay, let's get straight into it. Um, yeah, things just get wacky, wackier. Uh, I didn't get the job, by the way, so I am still here. So last week we <laughs> gave a bit of a rating to the government. They are 100, uh, what is it, four days into their job. And uh, we went round the panel and asked them what rating out of 10 they would give. And uh, so 105 days. So uh, we really want to find out from the new panellists especially, although Ate and uh, Simon, if you have anything to add, I will check with you. But especially for uh, Rodney and uh, Rex and Brendan, we're interested to know what your rating is. So the coalition, three parties, the media thought they would never last past a week. They seem to be actually functioning quite well. What would you give them out of 10? So perhaps I could get you to give them a rating out of 10 first and the things you have liked, and then we'll come back and find out what you haven't liked. So uh, Rodney, you're first off the block, uh, first time on the program. What do you give them out of 10 so far, and what things have you liked? I'm all in or all out, and I'm all out. So it's zero out of 10. <laughs> um, I, That's generous. I like the coalition agreements. Hmm. I thought they were a start. They've had the very best three months I'll ever have in government. They had three months to set an agenda and they have done nothing. They have frittered it away on minor things. Ordinarily, it's quite a good thing to have a steady as you goes government. So in the 60s, it was a good idea to have a steady as you go government. I think it was a good idea to have a steady as you go government in the 90s. But when Western civilization and the country as we know it and we love it uh, has hurtled over a cliff and all our base principles and values and traditions ha have been destroyed or in the process of being destroyed, hmm. we don't want a steady as she goes government. Unfortunately, that's what we've got. Okay, so um, I think the question was, I'll just check my notes, things you have liked about the government. Did you answer that question? <laughs> yes, I said I quite liked the coalition agreements when oh, they first right. came out. That's right. Okay, we'll come back and you can expand on the things you, you haven't liked. Uh, Rex, are you able to give them anything greater than a zero? Be you know, it's only one way up. Well, I think it's too early to rate them. It's like sort of a mile into a marathon. 26 <laughs> miles, but we're only one mile into it. It's about the rough pro rata oh, I've never done uh, assessment too. But um, mm. so I'd give them seven out of ten uh, so far. But uh, what I have liked, I've quite liked what I've seen of Nicola Willis so far. She's I didn't know much about her, and she's impressed me. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just thought I'd, I'd pull out one little quote from a from an article in the press this morning by a lady called Donna Mills, and here's what she thought about the new government. I seriously worry about the level of anger and division, this lunch snatching, beneficiary bashing, Maori alienating coalition government is creating in our society. And, uh, I thought that was, mm. you know, you couldn't really top that, but now she describes herself as an uh, Iranian Kiwi, so... 
I'll leave it at it. No, uh, what have I liked? Yeah, prop. Yeah, it, it's just a bit too early. So, um, okay. yeah. That co- that commentator sounds like the new co-leader of the Greens Party, or as I'm calling them now, the Scream Party. Uh, Brendan, uh, what do you give them out of ten? Uh, I'd probably give them a five out of ten, Bob. Um, I think for me, um, just staying with the positives, I think they've probably survived a couple of things and they've done okay at that, uh, particularly Waitangi. I think they rode the uh, rode the tsunami there actually yeah. relatively well. It, it wasn't glorious, but they did what you needed to do to sort of get out uh, and relatively unscathed in politics. Um, I think they're in survival mode, and I also suspect – that they are right now trying to figure out, now that they've got full access to the books um, and the reality of this looming financial crisis ahead of us, mm. I, I suspect they are probably like a deer in the headlights, like a lot of people at the moment, trying to figure out, well, what exactly are we supposed to be doing? Um, so, yeah, I'd give them five out of ten. I, I lean towards Rodney. There's some big issues here that they haven't touched on that I'd like to see more of, and we can talk about that in a second. But, yeah, really for me, I think probably I'm giving them five out of ten for the fact that they have held together relatively well. Uh, a coalition of three distinct parties there, and they've actually held together with some strong personalities, and they've survived a couple of uh, tumultuous moments as well. Okay. Uh, Simon, if I remember rightly, did you give them six last week? No, I, I was I was a seven, which I thought I was being curmudgeonly, but after the zero, I'm feeling, I'm <laughs> feeling very, very positive. <laughs> no, no change. No change, no change from last week. Okay. No big events. Arte, you um, were about a six or seven, were you, or was it five? Uh, I think I was six, but I'm heading toward um, the zero with five. <laughs> Are you? And okay, well, actually, let's yeah, well, let's move on and let's go on to the things that you haven't liked. So, Rodney, if you were prime minister or part of the coalition, what do you think they should be uh, getting stuck into straight away? Well, I'm not prime minister, thank God. Um, but there are, there are a lot of issues confronting New Zealand. and But the key thing to me is who are we? What is our national identity? What is it that we stand for? What is it that we're prepared to die for as a country? Hmm. What is it that we're prepared to fight for and live for? And things like free speech whether a boy can be a girl, whether there's to be one standard of citizenship, irrespective of the colour of your skin, these things should be non-negotiable for a centre-right government. They should be right at the core of the leadership of the National Party. We're not talking about a financial crisis. We're talking about a crisis of identity. And what I'd like to see, and of course we live in hope, is the leader of New Zealand articulate that and articulate a vision for New Zealand that will see us in good stead for the next 100 years. At present, all we're seeing is oh, school lunches or oh, marry names on departments. That's not cutting it. And I don't think Mr Luxon, Mr Seymour, Mr Peters and this government have any appetite for attacking it. And so I think when you look at where our young people are, how they're being schooled, how they're being raised, what they're being taught, uh, we're over the cliff. Mm. We're desperately over the cliff. And so that's why it's a zero. In many ways, I'd prefer Jacinda Ardern back. Uh, because careful, she careful, was, and, careful. No, I'm, I'm very serious about this because she was the enemy. And she galvanised us. But what we've got now is a lack of hope because we're not able to reverse what she's done and what has been done to New Zealand over decades, actually. Mm. And who can we vote for now? Because Jacinda Ardern's gone, but her legacy has been entrenched with no appetite for this present government to reverse it. 
I think it's a great opportunity because what it means is it's going to be us, the people, that have to do the reversal ourselves, that we can't look to someone in government to save us. But uh, that's why I give them a zero because there's no hope if we're looking to them to save us and to keep our cherished values alive for the next generation. Okay, very good point. Rex, um, you gave, now what was the mark you gave? Was it seven? Seven. He was generous seven. with a seven. It was very generous. Yeah. I think it was just to compensate your your pessimism. Uh, what what hasn't the government done in your view, Rex, that you, know, you think they should be doing? Well, uh, you know, I, I, again, I stress it's, unlike Rodney, I think it's a bit early. It's, um, they, have, they have to just bed themselves in and some of them are, are, are rookies. Take Luxon himself. He's, he's not a very experienced politician or parliamentarian. So he, um, but I, I, I do agree with Rodney that if you're looking for a charismatic, uh, you know, inspiring leader, you're not going to find it in the person of John Luxon, I'm afraid. It was um, Christopher Luxon. Uh, what yeah. did I say? Christopher uh, Luxon, John Luxon. John Luxon. Yeah, John yeah, Key's yeah. brother. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, Chris, Christopher Luxon just, he's, yeah, he strikes me as just one of those corporate kind of management types that, you know, reasonably competent in what they do. But, I mean, he said before the election, Strider right says it's all about economics, you know. In other words, he's, he's got, as Rodney would say, no vision of nationhood, really. He's there to, uh, the balance of payments and get inflation down and so on but you know he's 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 not really a leader in the mold that i think i agree with rodney we we would want to see so um who is that leader i, I don't know who it is a, hmm. a um you know a a winston peters who was only in his 40s or 50s might have been such a leader but at 78 it's not going to rise to that role now i would think so yeah Okay, uh, Brendan, what are you? What what uh, things are you not happy with? Well, I, I'm in agreement with Rodney. We are facing really an existential crisis, a crisis of meaning, and in a crisis of meaning, you actually need someone who can step forward. And and <clears throat> what's so frustrating here is that uh, we need an authentic conservatism, which is grounded in trying to actually conserve something which is good, true, and beautiful. And that's not happening. There's not even an enunciation of a vision for what that should look like. And I think that's because they're not even sure. Um, and I think about how so much has been centralized over the last six years. And what we really need to do is break the shackles of that sort of managerial you know, bureaucracy, the managerialism, and restore and strengthen the little platoons of the local community, the family, etc., and restore a certain subsidiarity and authority at that level, and th and that's completely lacking. There doesn't seem to be a vision for any of that either. And ironically, I think of the three parties together, I think probably everyone would have thought maybe uh, Winston would have been the firebrand or maybe Seymour would have you know, pulled <clears throat> things apart at the themes, but it's really Luxon, as others have said, who's not really delivering strongly. He's made a couple of big gaffes. And I think when I look at things like, for example, uh, Matt Ducey, just a week or so back, uh, being interviewed on TVNZ, and he's talking about the high rate of Maori male um, suicide. suicide. And he, he comes out and he says, look, um, that uh, the cause of that is colonialism. I mm -hmm. look at that and I think, A, that's not true, because the data shows that in the 1950s the Maori male suicide rate was actually 50% lower than the non-Maori suicide rate, and it's only 1996 where it actually got higher than the general population. So it's not mm -hmm. colonialism. Secondly... That is a progressive talking point, and it really makes me wonder what is the guiding philosophy here, and you desperately need one in this moment. Uh, Simon, did you have anything to add on uh, what you mentioned last week, just in the seven days since? No, I think I think a lot of it it holds. It's still early days, as I think most people are are intimating. But my key point remains that w while they're doing what they said they would, and that's a positive, which is repealing. Uh, it's really when the tyre hits the ground of what they're actually going to do. And I think you're hearing it from the other panellists is they're looking for a vision. They're looking to actually hold to good principles which are well articulated and that actually protect particularly our young ones, but all through the generations. And I think there's an absolute 
craving out there, certainly as I go out and about, people really want meaning. Uh, mm. Brendan used the word beauty. They want truth. They want beauty. Uh, they want a sense of purpose. I think, you know, hearing Rex and Rodney speak to that as well as a craving. And so isn't there an irony, and I'll finish on this, that at the moment where so much change in the most positive sense is wanted, people want vision, they're crying out for it, it's not being delivered. Okay, well done. Um, thanks, Simon. You actually said you were going to finish on that, and you did. So obviously you've improved from last week when you said you'd give us three points and gave us four. So thank you. Um, Arte, I um, can't did, count. <laughs> Arte, did you have anything to add uh, in terms of what you're not happy with the government on? Uh, I mean, I continue to... Uh, my. I'm really disgusted about... Uh, and, bringing um, Jacinda into, you know, the Christchurch call and to be an advisor. I feel it is a huge betrayal to national uh, voters because we really wanted to get rid of Jacinda. She's just a disaster. She, she, you know, I'll never forget that in two months during the pandemic, she introduced abortion up to birth, the transgender, the birth certificate, education of the parents. I mean, how disastrous is that? I mean, it was against the family. It was about abortion. And I just I find it really disgusting that we voted for national. And then a Luxon, who doesn't seem to have any sense of courage or vision, Bringing gender, I mean, I disagree with you know with Rodney, you know, respectfully. I think she just gets up there. Somebody else is pulling the puppet and and uh, say that we can't. But she's very unkind to have abortion up to birth, destroy the young people through transgender, and uh, birth certificate and destroy family. Thank. You. Okay, uh, let's just check uh, some of the messages that we have got. Uh, firstly, June says hello from Torbay. So. Good evening to Torbay. Got a big viewership there. Uh, Sue, who I think is in Tasmania at the moment, says we're going to hear more about DEI quotients, nonsense and businesses in the future. Rosie says, especially those who believe that men can get pregnant and give birth, only women can do that. Rosie, what are you trying to do? Get us cancelled or something? We're going to we're going to suddenly disappear off the off the social media. Charmaine says Luxon is an executive. He has employed Jacinda for the Christchurch call. Such bad judgment and out of touch with New Zealand New Zealanders. Neil says the RAC guidelines are still on the Ministry of Education website. I would like to see the government pull that for a start. Uh, Stacy says just say it. He's uninspiring. We're all uninspired. The people need hope. I think Stacy's not referring to you, Brendan. She's referring to, or he's referring to um, Luxon, and. Uh, uh, Trina, who's obviously been paid, says Simon O'Connor was the best that National offered. So there we go, Simon. Uh, there's an endorsement for you. Stop telling your friends to ring in. Okay, uh, it was it's bad. costing me a lot. My my stepkids haven't eaten for weeks as I divert all the money that way. Hey, but hey, it's not the eight hundred thousand dollars that the New Zealand Film Commission has given to do a documentary on Jacinda Ardern. Oh, uh, yes, that, there. That, that will get everyone, everybody wound up. Rodney, I think that might um, get <laughs> to, uh, getting a whole lot of money on a document. I'm sure you'll be sitting down to watch it live. Anyway, let's move on because it is related to it. Bad, new, bad week for television news networks. Uh, last week we talked about it. The owners of TV3, Warner Brothers Discovery, said they plan to close News Hub. And at the end of last week, the state broadcaster TVNZ said they were going to cut up to 68 jobs in a restructure, including dumping two news programs in the Sunday program, amongst others. Now, trust in media has plummeted to 42%, according to the AUT study of trends. And then, of course, there was that public interest journalism fund. And just before I go around the group, I just want to show this video because I think it sort of summed up why people have got very frustrated and um, actually, Simon, it was when Judith Collins was the leader of the National Party and she was raising issues around the public journalism fund uh, and Jacinda asked a very, or responded in a very interesting way to Judith Collins, the leader of the opposition, but then listen to the question line of the media as Judith Collins leaves Parliament. They're all singing off the same sheet. She's saying to people who are concerned that her $55 million public interest journalism fund, which includes numerous criteria for media to adhere to, is influencing the editorial decisions of media outlets in New Zealand. Oh. Mr Speaker, I would absolutely reject that. But Mr Speaker, better yet, 
um, I would put the question to the media and ask whether they agree with that sentiment. Are you, are you race baiting? I think that's a, a really lazy uh, way of categorising asking questions about our constitutional arrangements. So I really why he says that you've been constantly bashing Māori using racist rhetoric, racist propaganda, inciting racism in the populace to win votes from Pakia. What's your response? I think that's uh, a very lazy categorisation. Thank you. The Māori Party, though, they, they say they're upset by your questions, and they say that you're upsetting Māori around the country as well with your questions. What, what's your response to that? Well, the Prime Minister needs to answer my questions. Do you, think, do you see how uncomfortable this might make Māori feel, hearing themselves being talked about in Parliament in such a way that could be quite detrimental to the way that they feel and think about themselves? Well, I'd like all Māori to know that this is not talking about Māori. This is talking about constitutional arrangements. Isn't it essentially, isn't she doing, isn't this essentially what is in the treaty which every New Zealander should know? I don't know that all New Zealanders would view what the Prime Minister is now talking about as uh, the treaty. They would see, I think, that this is a radical interpretation. What's the radical interpretation? The Māori Health Authority, is that what you're referring to? No, I suggest you think about all the other issues the, I've been the raising. Constitutional there there are constitutional arrangements that are clearly uh, in play at the moment, and the Prime Minister needs to so be up front. Because you've brought them up, haven't aren't they? Because the Prime Minister is already undertaking a a stream of work, where her government is, that clearly is bringing about significant changes to ownership, uh, to governance, and we're now looking at what looks like a joint sovereignty. That is not something that I think most New Zealanders even realise. Isn't, isn't, isn't that the partnership under Te Tereti? Well, this is, these are questions I'm asking the Prime Minister. What does she mean by it? Yeah, OK. I, I wanted to show that because I don't know if you noticed, but basically every independent media outlet from each other were going down the same track and just going for it. Simon, that probably wasn't any surprise to you, was it? I mean, I'm sure you've faced a barrage of microphones and all the, uh, the, the, the media pack seem to be all on the same side ganging up. I mean, that's just normal, isn't it? Sadly, it is. And it, it's why I think I raised last week, as many other commentators, you've done it yourself, mm. Bob, have, have pointed out that at one level, why the loss of something like News Hub and obviously even the downgrading in TVNZ means you have fewer people uh, doing the work as such. It actually makes no material difference to the opinions because it's just the same stuff going around and around and around. And on top of it, it's often just bald-faced uh, lies. Uh, it's clear in that public interest journalism fund, uh, the criteria. It's there in black and white in some of the very controversial legislation uh, we've had. Arte touched on even like around abortion. It's in black and white what the law does and doesn't say, and yet media, the Prime Minister and others just outright deny it uh, and then turn it back on, gaslight, for want of a better word, those uh, who are pointing out. Hariti Hapanga, one of my wonderful now former colleagues, uh, pointed out what was in black and white. It was on the paper, uh, but she was she was bollocks for, um, uh, for even attempting an opinion. So there's no surprise uh, in any of this. At all. No. Okay. And Hareti Hapango is Māori, isn't she? So uh, you'd think that would give her some uh, credibility in commenting on these things. But she wasn't allowed, was she? Because it went against the narrative. Yeah, well, you've, you've either got to... You're, you're only fitting a particular category so long as you fit the moral and political views that follow it. So notice just for example, uh, Willie Jackson was always, and Calvin Davis and others were always Māori and they would list their whakapapa. But someone like my brother-in-law, Simon Bridges, only identified uh, as Māori, even though he whakapapa is very clearly into the king country. But notice always the subtle use of language. Um, you either are a Māori who buys into a particular agenda, or you're not. And if you don't buy into the political agenda, then you're sort of not really Māori, or you're not really this, that one thing or the other. It's very, very much the identity politics, uh, which we're drowning in, for want of a better analogy. OK, Rodney, I'm fascinated to ask you about this because um, I just quickly Googled and realised you left Parliament in 2011. So you've been out of Parliament for 13 years, but was dealing with the media, do you think it's the same now as it was then? No, it's completely different. Um, when I was there, the media were had a left-wing bias, but they were always interested in presenting the range of views and doing so fairly 
and the best of their ability, I always felt. Um, and that was what journalism was. To listen to that harangue from those journalists who come across as deranged pack dogs. I mean, they <clears throat> sound clinically insane uh, to be haranguing the leader of the <clears throat> opposition in such a way without troubling themselves to try and uncover the point that Mrs. Collins was attempting to make. And of course, the issue here is that the treaty is not about a partnership. Never was, and it isn't. And this has just become a radical interpretation that's occurred in New Zealand. And now we have a generation that has been brought up to think that to question partnership is to bash Maori and to be a racist. And so there you have it. Mm. And it was just a free hit for these journalists <clears throat> on a senior politician who was attempting to set the record straight. Mm. At the same time, of course, the media is circling, circling the drain, uh, going down the plug hole. But it's still an assault mm. on New Zealand and our values because anyone like us that stands up for the truth of the treaty, for the beautiful truth of the treaty, for what a wonderful document it was between Maori and European settlers, it was an astonishing document, an astonishing process. But of course, um, we have reinvented that history. Mm. And those journalists um, know not what they speak. Mm. And I'm afraid I've come to the view that I used to think that people of the left were misguided and ignorant, mainly ignorant of economics, mainly ignorant of um, institutions that we've inherited from our forefathers and their great role and place in society, but I now regard them as deranged. And that question line sort of highlights it. Mm. No self-reflection, no questioning of, I wonder if I'm wrong here, no humility, mm. none, no. no reflection. The sooner they all disappear down the plug hole, the better. <laughs> Okay, well, that uh, was a great segue to the question I was going to ask you, Brendan, and that is while we feel sorry for individual uh, people in the media and, and just the uncertainty and loss of jobs and change of career, do you feel sympathy for the industry? Well, I think that the industry itself doesn't seem to have any sense of self-reflection, no sense of ability to look at itself and say, <clears throat> how did we get ourselves into this mess? And, and even still this week, I saw someone on one of the news shows uh, where they were highlighting the fact that the media is one of the least tr trusted professions now in New Zealand. In fact, consistently, they right. appear as even less trustworthy than politicians. And someone had dug up a survey saying, well, look, we're a couple of points higher than politicians, so we must be doing okay. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. It's like that's not a response to this. I, I think the big problem is that a lot of people have forgotten that journalism is supposed to be a trade. And with a trade, you're supposed to learn the skills and then apply those skills. But they haven't been treating journalism like a trade. They've mm. been treating journalism basically like it's some form of activism, like it's some sort of liberal art. And that's a real problem. So a lot of them don't. Like if once upon a time, if you were going to cover, for example, crime stories or politics, you didn't just need to know personalities. You needed to know um, actual important facts that enabled you to do your job well. It just seems a lot of that's gone out the window. They don't really know as much as they think they do. There's a sort of fake intellectualism about it all. And they've lost, most importantly, the fundamentals of the trade. How to ask questions, how to commit to journalistic ethics, how to find out information. And to be fair, part of it is the system. The system has been mm. set up post the, uh, you know, particularly social media, but uh, just internet in general, where media companies did not adjust well. And what they did was they thought, oh, well, bloggers are going to be the new thing, so we have to give our content away free. They removed paywalls mm. rather prematurely, and that put all sorts of pressure on journalists to produce clickbait, and that's mm. not helping either. But if they got back to the basics of the trade, uh, then, yeah, I, I think things would actually be a lot better in New Zealand. Okay. Arte, I'm a bit scared to ask this, but do you agree with Rodney? You know, down the drain they go. Oh, turn your mic on, Arte. We got you. Sorry. There you are. 
Yeah, I think if they just uh, change and tell the truth and stop the hype, stop the spins, and um, because that's the bedrock of good media is independence and and to tell the truth. So um, yeah, and of course it didn't help when uh, Labour government gave them all that money uh, with so much strings, many strings attached. And if you just remember the briefings that Jacinda heard, only Norma and just and um, Jessica were allowed to ask questions. You know, I think people are stupid. Um, but I think it's a good opportunity now for the next generation of young people who are who will aspire to do this that uh, uh, Brendan is talking about. They will learn to tell the truth and think critically, and rather than uh, you know, which is their job to send let people decide for themselves because people are not stupid. Thanks. Mm. Yeah, um, Rex, that's a part that I always could never figure out, that if you criticise somebody, what the person does that's been criticised is try to prove you wrong and that they don't deserve the criticism. Uh, as far as I can tell, the media have been criticised for being biased, and in fact what they've done is just continued the bias and said, well, too bad. I mean, so therefore it seems like they've made a rod for their own backs. Well, I don't really have any great sympathy for the demise of uh, News Hub. And uh, if TVNZ also um, bit the dust, I don't think I'd cry too many tears. Um, anyway, there's a, there, there's a reconfiguration or a, a change in the way we access <coughs> news these days anyway. But getting back to our current uh, state of reporters and journalists, um, we've only got to look at their age and how young most of them are. And it shows your lack of experience. You know, you used to have people like Dick Griffin, Barry Soper, you know, the ones that had been in journalism for 20, 30 years or longer. And they had uh, been brought up with, you know, a, a, as a proper craft and a trade and learned their ways. Um, and, and now you're getting one straight out of a very left wing progressive course they've done in uh, journalism school and I don't know, Polytech or somewhere. And, uh, you know, they, they're, they're, they're fronting up. They're barely only 30. They're still wet behind the ears. Um, you know, they they have enough hubris to think they're very clever, but they're, they're not. I mean, by and large, you know, with respect, most most reporters and journalists are not very bright anyway. <laughs> That's just the reality, you know. Okay, I'll pass that on. Um, right, <laughs> let's just um, check uh, some of the comments here because they've been coming in like crazy. Uh, firstly, Edmund says, I liked Mr Hyde. I voted for him a few times. There we go, Rodney. Congratulations. Uh, Pamela says, no, we're not drowning in it. We've all switched off the mainstream media news. Uh, Charmaine says, the media's loyalty was with Jacinda and Labour. Uh, Susan says, here, here, Rodney, down the drain they go. Jeez, no sympathy from the crowd, is there? I heard someone say on the radio that the government, namely David Seymour, was trying to get rid of the lunch program. They're not. They're trying to improve it. Rodney, uh, Ronnie says, the fallacy of authority and intellectual superiority. Uh, Fiona says, oh, awesome, we'll catch this after dinner. Uh, maybe on the wrong YouTube channel or they're going f having fish for tea tonight, maybe, I don't know. Uh, me, he said, nice one, Dr. Ate. Truth is what's needed. Love your answers. So much wisdom. Can you tell your husband to stop um, contacting us under a pseudonym? Kevin says, when competing journalists collude to not report a particular politician, that is social engineering and activism, not journalism. And Oz says, oh, that's your wife, is it? Oh, um, Rex, love it, Rex. No sympathy for the Muppets, yeah. You guys have got all your friends ringing up, haven't you? So, um, okay, just before we go on to the next topic, quick advertisement. Family First has a new program starting up later this week. you got to watch out for it. Hi, I'm Tambi Stowers, and I want to tell you today about a new Family First feature program starting very soon that I will be presenting. It's called Pulse Point. As more and more families turn away from mainstream media sites, we want to fill that gap and put the spotlight on the latest news items and research that you need to be aware of. In other words, we'll watch the news so that you don't have to. We'll cut through the spin and uncover the real issues. 
will be a trusted source of the latest news and research affecting families and social conservatives, covering politics, family, life issues, faith and religious freedom, both here and overseas. Now, each episode of The Pulse Point will cover the news or research that the mainstream media has ignored, but which you need to know about. And of course, these tend to be social conservative issues that they ignore or misrepresent. But we will also check the news that the mainstream media has reported, which needs to be fact-checked or needs a counter view included to make it more balanced. You know what we mean. We really hope that Pulse Point will become a trusted and credible source of news for you and your family. The Family First team are looking forward to researching and reporting stories that really matter to all of us. It will be more than just headlines. So watch out for your regular episodes of Pulse Point with me, Tambi Stowers, and available to watch on our website, Facebook, Twitter, and on our YouTube channel. See you soon. Yep, there we go. That's our new feature coming up. Basically, we watch the news so you don't need to, and we'll tell you the important stuff. Uh, one other key date that we just want you to put in your diary, very important, and that is the Forum on the Family for this year, uh, the 4th of July and the 5th of July. So 4th of July is Independence Day, of course, and it's our Independence Day from the Charities Register, and the 5th of July is our all-day conference. Uh, we have got some amazing speakers coming, and we'll be announcing them very soon. Right, there's new research out uh, around the vaccine mandates. It's called the effect on... Va Actually, I think I've got an image of this. The effect on vaccine uptake and healthcare workers' uh, labour market outcomes. So basically... It's a survey as the mandates affected the health sector. Now, it wasn't done by a group of uh, people who might you might say are anti-vaccination. No, it was done by AUT, a director of nursing, a professor of Māori health, and a professor of economics, amongst others. And, uh, well, actually, to be honest, I'm going to come straight to you, Brendan, because I, <laughs> I saw that you did a podcast on this. Uh, and so you have got a great little summary of it. So maybe... Um, Tell us about what interested you about this research. I mean, I think I want to make it quite clear at the start of this that we've always maintained the position of neither pro or anti, but freedom of conscience. So we oppose the mandates. We got the petition with over 80,000 signatures. We tried to encourage rapid antigen testing as an alternative for those who didn't want to get vaxxed. So tell us about uh, what this research is saying and what you thought were the key points. Well, I think, Bob, it's really important. One of the big things for me is that at last we're actually starting to hear a balance. And and some of these policy questions that for far too long now have just been taken for granted as if they are infallible and beyond questioning and above reproach are now actually being questioned and in a very ro robust way in this particular research. And I think that's a really, really good thing. And I think one of the key points for me is that they highlight the fact, and this is something that we should have known, in fact we did know, because Jacinda Ardern actually even admitted this herself in an interview months before she brought in the mandates, was that if you use a carrot instead, oh, sorry, if you use a stick instead of a carrot, so you use a mandate when it comes to vaccinations, doesn't matter what the vaccine is, you get worse outcomes. And they highlighted that very fact in this research, and they highlighted the fact that already the vaccination rates amongst various workforces were already high. They were climbing upwards. The vaccine mandates did not cause them to spike at all. The trend was already heading that way, and most people had been vaccinated. So the key point is that this policy was really, really bad. All this talk about trust the experts, trust the experts, and for several decades the experts have told us if you use coercion around vaccination, you get worse outcomes. Don't do it. And one of the big key things that I've found here now is that there is a distrust that has grown around other vaccination schemes. And mm. that's really troubling because we've got a really uh, risky um, flashpoint at the moment, potential flashpoint around mm. measles in this country. And they're highlighting how there have been some other trust issues that have developed as a direct result of this. And that's not good. OK, uh, just Rodney has disconnected, so we're just trying to get him back online, which is why he's not showing in the pictures. Uh, Dr Arte, you're in the sector, health sector. 
Um, what do you think about the conclusions of the survey, of this research? Are they correct? Absolutely. I think all we need to do is to look at the state of the health system in New Zealand uh, compared to before the vaccinations. Uh, health workers are burned out. All the stuff, you know, when they were testing and stuff, it just people needed help, like just you know, people with heart attacks and stuff that is you know, needed to be taken care of. They were put aside. So mm. midwives, uh, you know, they're not paid properly. You know, just it's like we are almost worse than third health, uh, third world health. Um, you know, people waiting eight weeks to see a GP and longer. But I think the thing that um, you know, label and because I spoke up about the control, which I don't agree about control. Mm. Um, you know, Pacific people we are paid hundred to hundred fifty dollars per jab, and church, you know, divided churches when money was just being poured into Pacific Island churches, and so you know, it was just wrong. And then anybody who spoke up with some, you know, like the um, these people, you know, people who were being the doctors who were uh, cancelled, they were just labelled as anti-vaxxers, as misinformation. I, mean, I think the whole thing is about control and, you know, again, Labour and Jacinda were just really evil, the way they go about it, you know, and just forcing people and, you know, just not good at all. So I agree with what they had found. Hey, just Bob, the, hey, Bob on, oh, can I just yeah. say too that on what Arce is saying, one of the key findings actually in this um, research was that one of the fundamental reasons they claimed they needed the mandate was to secure and ensure continuity of health care service. And they said that it actually had failed because we had ejected so many people out of the healthcare workforce mm -hmm. that it's actually mm -hmm. made it work and it didn't yeah. really produce that result. Okay, and some other, Rex, just before I come to you, some other conclusions from the report were that affected health workers talked about the loss and ongoing trauma they have experienced. Uh, as Ate said, those opposed to the mandates are often incorrectly labelled as anti-vaxxers or even conspiracy theorists. And yet, this is AUT speaking, this is what the report says, all health workers we spoke to were pro-vaccination but had legitimate reasons for not completing or struggling to complete the required vaccinations. Some workers had health conditions that put them at elevated risk from the vaccine. And while some medical exemptions were available, the threshold for these was very high. Rex, what was your conclusion from this research? You've done lots of research. It looked pretty credible yeah. and solid to me, wasn't it? Well, I didn't have a close look at that, but I am following what's happening in the UK COVID inquiry and mm. another paper's been published around the world. And um, as Betty predicted at the time, um, the entire approach of having um, comprehensive quarantine or lockdowns uh, was always going to be a disaster. And... Because it it um, it simply doesn't look at, as an economist would say, all the opportunity costs. If you lock down, well, let's go back a step. The the received wisdom amongst epidemiologists prior to uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, pandemic was that comprehensive quarantines were always uh, a foolish and not an appropriate way to tackle a pandemic. Mm. And there's lots of papers published, that was consensus amongst them. Now, um, when when we had this, you know, new virus come along, uh, sadly, the, the, the West copied the authoritarian, almost totalitarian regime of China, copied their approach and uh, were largely spooked into taking an approach that epidemiologists themselves had never approved of uh, in the past. So this was a major reversal for them. And, and, and the numpties we had in New Zealand, you know, like the Roddy Corbett of uh, epidemiology, uh, Professor Michael Baker, who I have no time for. Obviously. Um, although he, he is a former <laughs> colleague of mine at um, the university, formerly known as Otago University. But um, and, and even the mighty Sir David Skeg and others, you know, these epidemiologists let us down, including, by the way, Professor Tony Blakely of Melbourne, who is the head or the chair of the our own mm. COVID inquiry. Mm. And uh, he's got form, as they say, so he shouldn't be uh, in charge of that himself. So 
Mm. Um, now all this was entirely <clears throat> predictable. Those those New Zealanders that tried to speak up against it, it was the COVID Plan B people who put out a paper in the middle of 2020, Dr. Simon Thornley and others, Auckland University, they were just shut down, said it was nonsense. We had internationally the Great Barrington Declaration, which uh, three top epidemiologists from Stanford, Oxford, and uh, Johns Hopkins all said focus protection or a very selective form of quarantine uh, was the way to go. Those eminent epidemiologists were ignored. Uh, even yours truly wrote a paper in August of that year, yeah. arguing for yeah. um, selective uh, <clears throat> quarantine and so on. So all you know, all, all this sadly is predictable, and it's all coming out in the wash now. And mm. um, I, I, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that some of these people, the, the consequences will be visited upon them, and including uh, Dame Jacinda Ardern. <laughs> She Look, is I not got... free from uh, the reach of the criminal law on this, by the way. Okay. And she I... won't be able to hide behind her uh, faux knighthood or damehood either. Okay, strong words. Are you feeling that cricket loss today badly? No, no, not at all. No, <laughs> I've risen above that already. <laughs> Uh, right, Simon. Um, yeah, what's 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 your thoughts on this? I mean, are you surprised at this? No, is the short answer. Um, look, firstly, kudos to the researchers. I think they've they've done a good job. I think yeah. it's actually slightly slightly encouraging, actually, that an alternative view um, has been able uh, to be not only created but but published and discussed. So it gives me a little bit of optimism. But it doesn't surprise me, and I don't think it actually surprises many of your viewers, because we all knew it intuitively. Uh, when you're forcing people out of their jobs, when you're twisting their arm, and all of us will know people, I've got two that are coming to mind, and I, I won't mention their names, but these are people of um, really good people who were put into a terrible conundrum within the health sector, um, where doctors and specialists told them their risks uh, for taking the vaccine um, to their health uh, and were forced out of their jobs. It was a terrible situation. Uh, but I think fundamentally it's that overreach, isn't it? I mean, most of us, I mean, we, we could speak for hours over COVID, but those early days as all of us grappled with what was going on, there was an open license relatively. But as time went on, um, there became an addiction to that control, which Arte, I, I think, referenced and others, and it became more and more controlling, more and more self-fulfilling, um, almost cyclonic. It was drawing people in. Either you agreed with what the government and its scientists wanted, and Rex has touched on those who got tossed out. Anyone equally qualified with an alternative opinion, not just ignored, but destroyed, reputations destroyed. So it just became sort of so self-aware. And what I mean by that to your viewers is that they sort of became so aware of the control, the power, the influence they had, they just kept going for it more and more and more. And you ended up with the madness of the mandates. Think about the rules in those days where you could have your family at the deck of your house, but they couldn't go inside to the toilet. Um, it, it just became this bizarre, bizarre world. Uh, and we sort of half laugh at it now, but my God, how disgusting. Mm. Uh, was that. So, look, I think most Kiwis get it, and we were resentful, and I want to finish on that word because I think we still are, mm. that basically we got divided, us and them. And the classic dynamic, and Brendan and I have talked about this before in different circumstances, you always alienate the other. And your viewers and listeners will know, some of them from personal experience, the names, the way they were critiqued, the way they continue to be. They were made mm. to feel alien other unwanted, you shouldn't be here. And that highlights the very destructive nature uh, of what went on. And arguably, now I will finish, that will have longer destructive repercussions than COVID itself. There we go, there's a big bold claim. There we are. I think all four of you could have written the paper yourself. Uh, let's just see what the uh, crowd is saying. Uh, Pamela says, being as Luxon and Seymour were so pro-mandated vax, 
how can we trust this new government, especially after National is getting Ardern back and doing a U-turn on the co-governance repeal? And Carla says, so refreshing to hear sensible people talking about this controversial subject. I agree with all the opinions shared here. Keep up the good work. Well, there we are. We will have some discussion. Now, we do just cross live to Rodney Hyde. Uh, and this is Rodney Hyde, yeah. Um, apparently, he texts me to say that um, he hadn't charged his phone. And now he's at home with no charge and no signal and no lights. So uh, he said he'll be better prepared next time if we have him back. So there we go. Right, final topic. And um, and look, uh, this isn't a beat up on Jacinda Ardern, but it is an issue that is interesting. The Christchurch call has drawn attention to the problem of dissemination of extreme and terrorist content online as a result of the mosque attack, the need for internet-based organisations to be part of the solution, but there has been significant mission creep in what was the worthy work of the Christchurch call, and it's actually becoming a threat to free speech. Now, to just say I don't want to pick on Jacinda Ardern, so it's some others that are involved as well, including French President Emmanuel Macron, who just put abortion in the Constitution last week because they're so obsessed with it. But they held a meeting in Paris last November, and in the statement at the end of the Paris meeting, it said this, uh, the leaders endorsed a number of actions, including, down the bottom there, counteract online misogyny and anti-LGBTQIA plus hatred as a vector for violence, violent extremism. Now, I think we all abhor the violent terrorist attack that happened about four years ago, almost to the day. But the last time I checked, this attack wasn't based on misogyny and it wasn't based on anti-LGBTQ, etc. hatred. So, um, look, Simon, you were in Parliament when this was all floated. Um, is this mission drift or is just this just the typical... They're obsessed with this topic and they'll find it in everything and anything they do, even when they're printing money like the Reserve Bank. Um, it, it, it's both, uh, but it's also just an agenda. Uh, and I hate that word, but it, it, there's an absolute desire to label anything which <clears throat> does not accord to the woke, progressive, liberal, whatever term you want to use, um, think or series of thoughts is ex extreme. That's why now uh, anyone on the right is no longer just centre-right. They're far-right, they're extremists, they're fascists. We, get, we just get this overuse of, of language. And so from the very moment, sadly, of, of the terrorist attack uh, and the loss of those Kiwis mm. in uh, Christchurch, we, we've instantly seen an attempt to, to change the narrative or broaden it, not change it, but to be clear, to broaden the narrative so the Royal Commission um, instantly is off on a massive tangent, very similar to what you're now touching on. The Christchurch call from day one, from day one was attempting to conflate a whole wide range of issues. Um, and in many ways, I think it does disrespect actually to our New Zealand Muslim community and those families that in particular uh, suffered. What happened there was quite particular. Um, person involved, quite deranged, but it was quite particular. But now they're trying to leverage off that for wider for wider issues. And it's just, it's wrong and it's conflationary. And by that, I mean, again, you're just taking an issue here and you're trying to conflate it with a whole lot of, of others. And by, by and large, to demonize people who have alternative views um, or rather views that are alternative to what, you know, the likes of Jacinda and Macron uh, think. And so we should just ignore it. And if there's any hope, uh, the Christchurch call is pretty much ignored anyway. No one really sees the value in it. Um, mm. Very few have signed up to it, by the way, um, by and large. Okay. Um, Rex, is it is it worth promoting the Christchurch call, the good parts of it, or is this is it always just going to no, sink it's... down into this mission creep? No, it's just, just the damp squib. I mean, it, but it's part of the whole attempt to usher in online censorship codes. We, there's, there, there's a very dangerous one just being introduced in the Republic of Ireland. There's one in Canada. The, the, you know, New Zealand will be part of the keeping up with the Joneses that will should be seen to also have our own online um, censorship regulation. Mm -hmm. But it's it's I, I, I think it's totally unnecessary, not just unnecessary, but uh, quite dangerous, and um, si uh, Simon is quite right. You know, conflationary, or I, I would say it's pretextual. That is to say, this event is used as a pretext 
to bring in a whole lot of other laws that we were, were thinking about. So gun laws, you know, be, be, because this Australian had a whole lot of guns, we should therefore <laughs> tighten up on gun laws. Be, be, because he had written some half-baked diatribe uh, where he put out his ideas, therefore we should have <laughs> greater censorship and so on, you know. I mean, should should we should we reduce the number of Australians coming into the country because he was Australian? That, 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 that's about the level of the logic. It's just uh, it's, it's it's just quite and, and there's, there tends to be an overreaction. I, I'm I'm thinking of a legal example here. So we had the ancient uh, common law defence of provocation, which is defence the murder could be reduced to manslaughter mm. uh, in certain circumstances. Now that common law defence provocation was abolished in 2009 after provocation was pleaded in the Clayton Weatherston case mm. where he had stabbed his ex-girlfriend 60 odd times and he, mm. you know, his lawyer in that case raised provocation but that was seen as such a outrageous invocation of it in that instance that well let's uh, look at it again let's, let's throw out the defence altogether. And that's just one example but you know, yeah. There's this knee-jerk reaction that we should really try and avoid. Okay, Ate, uh, are you surprised that it's gone like this? Oh, turn your mic on, Ate. <laughs> yeah, the Christchurch call really long way. It's really dangerous. Uh, it's um, you know, as Simon has said. This is just the woke agenda. Uh, it's got one purpose only. It's about control that we've discussed. There are many pretexts. It's whether it's hate speech, pronoun, transgender, anti-freedom, free, you know, free us from patriarchy, anti-free speech, but it's all packaged, supposed to package nice as if people are stupid. It's, it's packaged under the pretext of compassion which is absolutely ridiculous. But its aim is to divide people by race, ethnicity, religion, vaccine stages, whatever it is. But, uh, and, you know, and against men. And their whole aim is to bring chaos. And when it's, when the, you know, when the uh, society is chaotic, then they think that it's a reason to bring in uh, government control. So, and... As I've said before, Jacinda is the last person on earth to be this. She is evil. Thank you. Okay. Um, finally, Brendan, it's, you know, like it seems like that something that is well intentioned, that sounds like, you know, online extremism is an issue, especially where it's, you know, threatening, um, you know, a death and, and harm to people. But it always seems to blow out to something much more and not even relevant. Yeah, I think there was a couple of issues here. One is there's definitely a Trojan horse here. This was definitely what people were going to use as a Trojan horse to promote other agendas. That's always happened. They've been doing this at the UN for decades now, taking a document about family, for example, and inserting a whole lot of ideology in it to try and get it across the line. So using it as a Trojan horse. Mm. I think there's also a lack of um, clear-headed thinking. Emotionalism sort of took over. We've got to save the world. The state is your saviour. It's your mother. It will fix everything when it actually can't. And then I think also... Like they didn't even wait for the ink to dry on proper investigations about the causes and the contributing factors in this case before they were declaring we know what the problem is and we'll fix it. And and I like for example, I'm someone who read the actual manifesto that um, Tarrant wrote before it was outlawed, yeah. and because I wanted to understand why he'd done this. And when you mm. read it, he 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 was pro China, he was pro environmentalism. Hey, we're going to lump all of those things into extremism now as mm. well. I mean, the biggest thing for me is, and this is the key point, you will not solve this particular problem or prevent another one of these tragedies with a Christchurch call. And, mm. and with online restrictions, what you actually need is a restoration of a solid online sense of, uh, offline, sorry, sense of meaning and living in the real world with real people mm. and community. So you pull people out of those online spaces. You don't do it with just online restrictions because you can always get around those. What you need is not more technology, but less of it and drawing people back into the real world, into the real community with other people and, and with a sense of awareness about what's going on around us because that would have stopped this crisis if more people had been aware. Yeah, okay. Uh, right, just uh, some final comments here from Trina. She says, uh, far right 
equals right so far. Um, good point. Uh, Christine and Brendan uh, say, hmm, shortbread. I don't know what you guys are doing while you're watching this program, but it sure is weird. We're fishing. We're making shortbread. Um, this one was interesting. Guy says to Stephen, the easiest method to alleviate stress is to maintain a consistent stream of income covering monthly costs on a weekly basis. Pro I mean, what? yeah, okay. Um, anyway, quote, quote, quote of the night, and it's because we were talking about France enshrining abortion in their constitution. Uh, and Sione says, imagine enshrining murder in your country's constitution. Great point, Sione. Right, uh, that is it, all we've got time for tonight. Simon and, or uh, well, Rodney's not here, but Simon, you'll be back as punishment. Uh, and Rodney will be back as punishment next week. Uh, we've also got Ashley Church. And we've got three panellists back for the first time next week. Christine Rankin, Dr. Michael Reed, and family first researcher Ale Pomalele. We'll be back. We may even get a peek at little Samuel, who is now six months old. So, Rex, great performance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brendan. Nice to have you back as well. Simon, we'll see you next week. And Dr. Ate Moala, thank you very much. Thank you for watching Straight Talk, and we will see you next week at 8 o'clock. Good night. Yeah.